Welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast, episode number eight. And today I'm joined by Rowan. How's it going? Hello. Good, good. How are you? Not too bad. Sorry to all our listeners about how that this podcast's a couple of days late, but just sometimes life gets in the way of the fun things that we want to do. That's right. That's all right. Um, let's just jump into it. Happy fourth birthday to Home Assistant. Yeah, I know. So I actually, by the time this uh, podcast is released, it would have been the fourth birthday. So yeah. uh, happy birthday. So that is uh, September 18th, I believe is the date. It's pretty um, crazy. Yeah, it's uh, it's according to the to the blog post on uh, on the website. It's uh, over eight thousand stars on GitHub, and over eight hundred platforms supported, which is amazing. So that that eight hundred uh, platforms number just blows me away. Yeah, it's uh, that's <laughs> pretty steep. I mean, considering again, it's only four years old, so that's uh, that's kind of cool. It, I think part of that is just because of how easy it is to create a new platform. Like you can you can build a new platform in twenty lines of code. Yeah, it's just yeah. So like, I, I always beg on OpenHAV, but just thinking about the amount of Java code that you have to write to support a new component in OpenHAV compared to, you know, here's the framework and just dump your specific code in. It yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah, and 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 this is one of those things where again, even using. Uh, a more modern language like Python helps as well, right? Mm. Um, so it's just, it's easy to, and, and it's funny, off off air, Dan and I were just talking about this, about how you can just, you know, use somebody else's code and reuse that and things like that. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, just, it just makes it, again, not that you can't in any other platform, it just makes it a heck of a lot easier, I, I find at least, in, in Python. So... Yeah, and even people that don't really know Python, using things like Act- App Demon, it's actually possible because you can, you know, it's fairly logical and you can just copy and paste from people's examples and, you know, get something together that works. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, again, great great work uh, to the uh, Hascore team. Um, you guys have done a fantastic job and, and the extended team as well and to everybody that's contributed. Thank you as as users. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that I opened a pull request for Wemo motion sensors. Um, that got closed yesterday because I haven't touched it in like three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry, Paulus. <Yeah. laughs> I will. Again, life gets in the way, right? So. Yeah, I, w- I will come back and fix it because at the moment, every time I update Home Assistant, I'm having to copy my version of Wemo.py back in because every time I update, it gets overridden. <laughs> yeah. So I really should spend the half an hour that I need to to get it done but yeah life <laughs> that's it sometimes half an hour is hard right so yeah exactly so I, I so so again a big shout out to everybody that has spent the time yeah absolutely uh, we all realize life gets in the way and you still uh, spend the time to actually do this kind of stuff hmm. sometimes it's more like hey I've got this platform and I want it to work and and it's again giving back to that community as well right because chances are other people have it as well so hmm. Exactly. All right, on to the latest release, 5.3 release, um, which was actually last week. Um, cars. Let's start with cars because that's quite exciting. Uh, yeah. Tesla support. Uh, that's it. Tesla's, that's like you can you can pull stats from there and stuff. That's actually really cool. Not that I'll ever have a Tesla, but one can dream. <laughs> See, I, I, I think for me, this is just more reason I need to, I need to get one. <laughs> con- convincing myself now that I need this just because yeah. it, it integrates. Um, yeah, but yeah, there's, there's the lock sensors, there's there's binary sensors that uh, actually I haven't even looked at what the binary sensor does. Uh, but the HVAC sensors uh, that actually pulls in the HVAC uh, status and uh, I believe the temperatures inside and outside of the car as well. So And being able to control it. So, you know, you get up in the morning and the house goes, well, okay, in an hour you're going to be heading out to the car and the car temperature is currently minus three. So let's warm that up a bit. Yeah, and and well, and even even where is your car, right? So device tracker <laughs> as part of that as well. Yeah, exactly. In case, uh, in case for whatever reason you can't find your car, um, I guess I guess uh, a fun night would uh, would constitute that. And now your house can find your car for you as well. Yeah, you wake up in the morning. Uh, where's the car? <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's right. It's, it's like you're an idiot. You left it outside the bar. 
<laughs> you you did the smart thing and didn't drink and drive. So okay. good job. <laughs> Um, and then the other one as well is, uh, is Mopar. Um, so, uh, anybody with a Uconnect, um, again, it's, uh, remote lock, unlock, engine, turn on lights, uh, and horn. So, um, again, super cool. Um, I think, I think this is kind of getting us into that next, uh, generation of, uh, extending the smart home outside of the home and into your car now. Right. Um, and I know yeah. there have been a couple of others that I think I saw Volvo in there a while ago um, and, and, and a couple of others, I think. So I'm um, just taking this further. Again, for me, uh, I don't have a Tesla, but super exciting to see that in there. Um, I really want one. So <laughs> now, uh, again, it's just, it's just more reason. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yes, yeah. some of the other ones. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was exact. I was going to just yeah move us on as well. <laughs> we oh, both perfect. decided to do it at the same time. <laughs> um, okay, that go. I mean, uh, voice assistant. So Mycroft. So I didn't actually know this was uh, this was a thing. Hmm. Um, I, like I've I've heard of the the concept of having a uh, having a voice uh, a voice assistant that's kind of offline, but offline, i.e., it's not uh, cloud connected, like. Uh, like a, a an echo or or a home right whereas this is uh so I, again for me i learned something new uh reading this as well uh, i knew these things existed but here's the first one that's actually integrated now all right this might actually no i don't think it's the first one that's integrated into home assistant but uh it's it definitely looks uh interesting so uh from a voice assistant perspective so that's kind of cool yeah runs on a pie or you can buy the air um the one which has a few little extra features, including uh, what seems to be a mouth as an LED screen on the front, which is a little bit creepy. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. The, the box, uh, it's the Mark 1 is what they call it. And, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of cute, kind of has like this Wally kind of vibe. And then uh, the other part of it is it's 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 a little too real <laughs> for, for uh, it's just like, uh, it's just, just, yeah, it's just weird. Yeah, I'm presuming that the LED strip actually kind of talks like a mouth when it's talking. I really hope it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it does as well, but uh, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a slight weirdness factor in there too. It's uh, <laughs> so yeah, I like it though. Uh, it's uh, it's an yeah, awesome it idea. seems like a really cool concept. There's gonna, be, I think, there's gonna be a lot of these. Um, you know, open source AI slash voice assistants, and eventually I'm hoping that there'll be a standard and, you know, everyone will yeah, kind of come together and go, this one's the best, so we're going to use this. Yeah, exactly. And and eventually everybody's going to end up running a data center in, the ba- in their basement. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, just again, so, so, today it's, it's a pie because, yeah, cool, we've got all these things. And as you expand the functionality, it's going to be a whole bunch of more pies essentially or and or servers you end up with a so, cluster of pies yeah that's it you can already get um rack mount enclosures for pies that take like a whole lot of pies in a row and put it into a rack yeah so i was actually i don't i don't remember which one it was but i was this is uh when the pies first came out uh i was super infatuated with with the pie and i was like this is so cool i want to i want to build um uh, like mini servers out of this right this is before i got into the containerization and things like that so i was like hey this would be kind of neat um instead of actually doing virtualization why don't i have a bunch of pies and then i was like uh this is also sort of not practical for me at least at uh at that so yeah so there's actually um I just did a bit of a quick google there's actually a raspberry pi blade center um that you can 3d print which is basically Amazing. a a two U high um, enclosure that you it has a whole lot of caddies for Raspberry Pis. Wow, that's pretty cool. I, I feel like I want this just just for the sake of having it <laughs> for my for my one Raspberry Pi that I have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I lost count of how many I have. They're just I've I've got a lot of um, Raspberry Pi Bs, the original ones. And they're just so easy to throw in in a room for, you know, oh, I want a temperature sensor or 
I want to be able to read RFID here or, you know, things like that. So there's quite a few on my network. Yeah, it's it's funny. I've started uh, I've started getting really into the uh, ESP eighty two sixty sixes for that, um, yeah. just to build sensors and things like that. Those are mm. amazing little boxes or yeah, little quite, controllers. So quite gotten the hang of it yet. I've got a couple of um, Node MCUs, and I just haven't quite got into actually getting them out and using them. I'm sure once I actually get into it, it's going to be pretty straightforward. But you know, so far looking at you know having to do the firmware builds and all that kind of stuff, it's a little bit daunting. Yeah, I mean it's not uh it's not the easiest uh to use, right? But I mean that's that's also kind of goes with the territory at least today. Right? Hopefully hopefully yeah, that absolutely. changes over time, but Yeah, and they're like two dollars. So what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean you can't really complain at that point, so <laughs> No, you really can't. Right, what else yeah. have we got on the list? Uh customization okay. editor. Talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, being yeah, able to that, uh, ins- you know, get the, inspect the, ex- the um, attributes that are available is kind of handy because then you don't have to go to the docs and go, hmm, what, what things can I set? You just go, oh, these are all the things I can set. Exactly, exactly. So this is uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, I mean, the, the documentation of it is, or the, even the blog post, I mean, it's pretty straightforward in terms of what it does and kind of how it works right you got a GUI that says hey i want to rename this and i want to change the icon for that kind of thing and uh mm. which is which is pretty cool and and kind of alongside that as well there's a new uh input text yeah. for freeform text as well so which is uh pretty uh pretty useful as well if uh, if you don't want it named certain things or if you want to have a essentially just a little uh freeform uh text in the ui that's uh kind of useful yeah i kind of i think that was uh that was a big ask too from people yeah i haven't quite been able to think of an application for me at least for it yeah i'm 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 well honestly i'm just lazy i'm just like <laughs> i see what is i see stuff on the screen and i'm like cool all right and then for me it's my my I mean my end goal is I don't use the home assistant UI. My end goal is kind of uh everything natural voice controlled kind of thing, right? Turn on the lights, turn off the lights, that kind of thing. So and and home assistant's just the the engine behind it. So but uh but for people that do use that as a front end, I mean that's that's great. Yeah, I've I've you know started not having to open it much at all. I've been very gently adding bits and pieces and yeah, trying to avoid having to interact with the UI, and so far so good. Yeah, it's it's gotten to the point where for me it, it, that's actually become a problem because I don't check the UI at all. Um, and what ends up happening is every time I do an update, and I just kind of skim through the skim through the blog posts, and I'm just like, all right, whatever, I'll just I'll just do a Docker pull, hmm. and uh, or Docker compose pull. And then, and it just updates and then I don't look at the breaking changes and I don't really open the UI again because again, everything is front ended by my echo. Mm. So it's, it's, which for me is actually a good problem to have, right? Is I don't, I don't want to be using the UI. I want to, it's, it's, so I'm kind of living what I, what I want my home automation to be. So yeah, but then you open the UI and there's five things that have failed to load because of breaking changes. (laughs) Yeah, and so so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think I mentioned my uh, my home assistant uh, VM uh, blew up and it just didn't come back on. So uh, again, everything's Docker container and all the configs are on my NAS and everything. So I just uh, popped it into another uh, Docker VM of mine and then and ran it. And turns out I forgot to change uh, a couple of IP addresses that that I had statically set and. Uh, essentially i had no smart uh smart things integration <laughs> oh, yeah. and and I, and i didn't realize it because my for my smart things pieces i was just using my alexa straight and oh i said the word uh, and i apologize to everybody and uh and on the echo it is just turning it on and off and then i was wondering why it's like hey some of my some of my automations aren't fully firing and i was like what's going on and i look and i was like oh gosh okay yeah. So, again, good problem to have. I'm I'm okay with that. I wonder if that. 
I wonder if there's a way to do like a notification if any components fail to load. Oh, I'm. I wouldn't. I. Just, I don't see why not. If, even if nothing, I'm sure App Demon can do it because it can pull it from the uh, the log. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm giving you a new feature to think about. Yeah. Yeah. That's Sorry. that. I'm going to put that one on the back burner before I even start. <laughs> <laughs> just I've got way too many other uh, other things that I need to <laughs> get working first. Uh, and another cool uh, cool feature as well. So KNX. Um, so if anybody uses this with building automation systems, uh, with sorry with HVAC proper uh, building systems as well, mm. um, they we've I mean the Home Assistant Group has kind of uh, done a re implementation of that KNX um, modules, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So. Pretty cool. Oh, I found a 404 on the uh, release page. Uh-oh. <laughs> I, I would say yeah. I'd put a pull request in to fix it, but let's be honest, I probably won't get around to it. <laughs> oh, man, there you go. So I'm, I, I, as far as I know, Paulus listens to this, so there you go, Paulus. <laughs> um, I think I, I believe Dale listens to it too, so there you go. Yeah. Right. Um, what else have we got? Um, I got an email. Uh, lost the person's name. One moment. Got an email from Dr. Robin Cole. Um, he sent me a link to Hexter.io and asked if I could mention it, mention it on the podcast. Um, so, from what he tells me, it's one of the one of the most popular maker project websites around. Yeah. And there's actually a home assistant section now, so you can go and kind of post projects to say, you know, here's the step-by-step -step guide, here's all the code. Um, and, yeah, people, I guess the people that have, you know, created this space and are starting to post to it are hoping that it could possibly become a central point for information about projects. So instead of, you know, having to go to a million different GitHub repos or anything like that, you can actually go in and see, you know, it's like hijack a Hue remote to control anything with Home Assistant, Raspberry Pi camera doorbell. So there's full, you know, like project logs and instructions. So I yeah, thought that was are, quite cool. Yeah, actually, I, I I don't know where I found it. It must have been Reddit or something. And uh, there's a couple of uh, alarm control panel tutorials and things like that on here as well. So mm. um, yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, I see there's there's a few things. Hopefully that uh, the numbers keep growing on this as well. This is, uh, this is a great... Uh, great idea to pop them all on uh hackster so yeah and it just it takes you know the community to get behind something and go yes we'll all use this and that will be a way to you know actually have everyone in on it mm -hmm. exactly hmm. so yeah go check it out um everyone that's listening and if you've got any projects you can pop them up there and we'll get some momentum behind it Exactly. Well, uh, I guess we'll put those in the, the link in the show notes as well. Absolutely. I've actually been getting some people saying, thanks for all the show notes. You've actually been remembering to put links you mentioned in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, again, it's useful, right? It's, uh, it's click and go. So Yeah. <coughs> right. Now, we had someone request that we talk about presents. And there are so, so many different types of presents. And we're already 25 minutes into this episode, so it could be a long one. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, where do you want to start with this? I think we'll start with the, I guess, the simplest one, which is motion detection. And there's so many different ways. There's Wemo motion sensors. There's just PIRs, um, Ben's awesome multi-sensor that he built. Mm -hmm. has a PRI on it. PIR on it. Um, there's, you know, all the Zigbee and Z-Wave sensors, you know, the AOTEC 6 and 1, for example. Just so many motion sensors. Um, I've got it integrated with my alarm system as well. So, you know, when the alarm sees motion, it sends an MQTT message to say, you know, I've detected motion on the sensor. There's just so many. And it's, I guess it's a good, you know, starting point for especially things like turning lights on when you walk into a room because it's the most immediate. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, motion sensors are pretty uh, pretty accurate because again, the time between what it takes to detect you to the time that an automation fires based on that um, typically is pretty pretty quick. Uh, again, I use I use uh, Zigbee Z Wave uh, motion sensors uh, at home and and more so for the security perspective. Uh, and if you look at like if I walk by it and I look at I'm looking at the home assistant screen, it's again like less than a second between when i walk by and when it goes pop um mm, exactly. so it, that that's that's a good point actually and and again the the problem is there has to be motion right that's kind of one of the downsides if you're sitting in a if you're let's say like i work from home quite a bit yeah if i'm sitting at home and or sitting in my home office and i'm kind of just sitting in front of the computer and working there it's probably not a ton of motion right so and the lights go off on you, which is always frustrating. Yeah, and and I mean, even even when I do go into my uh, to my uh, office office, and again, all it's all the lights and stuff are all uh, motion sensor activated and such, and <laughs> you see the lights turning off on you sometimes, and you're like, oh wait, I'm still here. Yeah, and then and, you do the uh, the whole arm waving thing in the direction <laughs> of motion sensor. <laughs> well, I- exactly, right? And 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 it's funnier when there's a group of people. When there's like let's say four or five people, everybody's sitting sitting around and just kind of working. Nobody's really moving, <laughs> right? Everybody's yeah. like kind of on their laptops or whatever. And all of a sudden, you see like eight people fl- flailing their arms. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> That's so right? funny. It's, uh, yeah, and, and I, <laughs> I've had that happen to me before, right? Um, but but motion sensor again to your point is probably the most immediate and uh, and also again pretty uh, narrow in terms of where it sees it right so uh, which is which is a not not always a bad thing yeah motion's a good a good kickoff for automations but it doesn't maintain them and that's where all the rest of these presence detections come in um, Bluetooth especially yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, was it you that was mentioning it a while ago that uses Happy Bubbles? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Um, yeah, Happy Bubbles is awesome, and you know, knowing where you are in the house, but it also takes about five to ten seconds to gather enough data to decide that you are in a room. Mm-hmm. So it's nowhere near fast enough to turn lights on, but it's more than enough to keep the lights on if you're in the room, which is the the second part to motion, which we, you know, we just discussed is keeping the lights on if you're not moving around. Exactly. And, and Ben from uh, Bro Automation actually did a really cool tutorial on it. And uh, just one of the things you notice as well is a little bit of that lag time. Mm. Um, when, uh, when he did a test and you walked into the room and he's like, okay. And then a couple of seconds later, it's like, Boop, the light turns on. So that's, I, again, Bluetooth is, and, and one of the things is, uh, especially for iPhone users out there, you, at least for me, I always carry my phone on me. Um, and, and again, that's, that's a perfect beacon that's on you all the time. Exactly. Uh, I mean, other than that, I mean, you do get other, like other BLE beacons as well. Yeah. Uh, I have, or you, you can even make your own. Mm, because we use RFID around the house a lot. I have a a retractable keychain that lives on my belt and it has my BLE beacon and my RFID tag. And I just wear that, you know, on whatever pants I happen to be wearing. Um, yeah. And that way I've got everything I need for to, you know, interact with the house. Um, and, yeah, doesn't drain my phone battery that way either. Yeah, and, and that's one of the trade-offs as well, right? When you start using apps or phone battery or, or, or phones for this kind of thing is you have to worry about your battery. Um, I mean, it, does it take a ton? Probably not. But again, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a Bluetooth power chip expert by, by any means. But, um, but it, it, it does, at the end of the day, take a hit, right? Whether minimal or a little more than that so yeah and the other presence options that use your phone um, for example the nmap ping um, or your router um, yeah. or gps as well gps especially um, most of the gps apps especially um, locative and own tracks actually let you um, not announce your location all the time but do it based on geofences so it is you know kind of fuzzy 
in that it's not using super accurate GPS, but it can go, oh, I'm within, you know, 500 metres of my house or 500 metres of work, so I'm probably there. So that that kind of cuts down on it. Yeah, and and it's also, you have to think about fidelity as well. Um, How accurate do you need it to be? Is it more of a, hey, I'm in the I'm in the house or I'm not in the house or is it hey I'm in my home office room uh, or my living room sitting here versus on the other corner of the house as well right so the the fidelity is kind of kind of important as well sometimes uh, like in my car I just have I have a Zigbee uh, presence sensor it's just like a hey car is here or car is not here cool Mm. right I mean it would with regards to where in my house the car can be, that's it's pretty limited, hopefully at least. <laughs> I.e. my driveway or my garage. So mm. it's, it's again, so, but whereas if I'm doing something like what you said with Happy Bubbles, which is, hey, Dan is still sitting in this room, then the fidelity is a little more important. Yes. All right. Um, things like your your network, uh, like so Nmap as an example, will not give you that. It'll give you a, are you connected to the wireless network? Yes or no, right? Or, or sorry, are you connected to the network? Uh, is this device connected to the network rather? Yeah. Um, which, which and, and I'm actually not a huge fan of the Nmap, uh, Nmap method at all, just because from, even if it's once a second or once every 10 seconds or something like that, that's still something that my phone is responding to every X seconds, right? Yeah, and comes back to the battery thing again. Yeah, I find an Nmap especially, and, and and maybe people out there can correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's that one especially takes a hit. Mm. Um, I'd rather go into a like go into the router or go into a wireless controller or something like that and pull that to see if it's uh, yeah exactly if if the device is connected or not. Yeah, and I guess with all of these things, like you said, with the fidelity of it, you need more than one. Um, Motion tells you when someone enters a room. Bluetooth low energy tells you when you're still in the room. The network wi- or wireless or GPS tells you, you know, vaguely where you are um, or, you know, if you're close to home. And you kind of need to combine them all to get accurate information. And that's where the, one of the new sensors that's just been released, which is the Bayesian sensor, mm-hmm. which you can set, you know, if... GPS says I'm home, the probability of me being home is, you know, pretty good, but not 100% because I might be, like, for example, our house has a pretty major highway coming past behind it, so I can drive past on the highway and own tracks goes, oh, you're at home. And I go, no, right. no I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just left home and walking around or driving around or something. Yeah, I right? just drove past, so I, like, appear home for five seconds and then disappear again. So we, you take the Bayesian sensor and go, well, if own track says I'm at home, that's a you know, 0.4 probability that I'm at home, or 0.5. And if you know the car's home as well, then that adds another 0.1. Or you know, if my phone's on the Wi-Fi, that adds you know, 0.8. And it kind of adds them all together. And that way, you know, if your phone drops off the Wi-Fi, but your BLE beacon's still broadcast and the car's still home and your GPS says you're at home, it'll still say you're at home. That's the real, so you can combine all of them without having to do any automations or any ifs or anything in your, you know, in your automations. And it's just a single sensor that says, is Dan home? And it goes, well, this, this, and this says he's home. So he must be at home. Yeah, that's, that's actually really, you know what? I've never actually noticed this. Um, It's a brand new sensor in the last release or so. Yeah, like, like, no, but like, sorry, in the sense that I've never even like, thought of giving uh, it a right. score kind of thing right yeah. and then kind of taking an average of the score or taking mm. uh, taking a summation of the score um which is this is actually super cool i'm I'm just looking at the sensor right now at the component right now and this is uh it's pretty neat so mm. yeah i mean that kind of helps solve that problem as well <laughs> yeah exactly it's yeah it makes a big difference i haven't actually um implemented it yet but it's going to replace a lot of code that I've written to do exactly the same thing. Yeah, which is uh, very neat. So good yeah. job to whoever wrote that. <laughs> yeah, a couple more um, 
a couple more uh, automation uh, presence things. Um, mm-hmm. Pressure is one. Um, yeah. It's for bed um, or floor occupancy. So you can, there's an awesome project on my sensors, which I'll put a link for uh, in the show notes, where you put capacitive sensors, which are just basically copper strips in your bed. And you can sense, you know, if someone's on one side or the other or on both or right in the middle. Um, so that way, you, you know, if both people are in bed and it can feel, you know, a body on both sides, then it's probably time to turn all the lights off in the house. Yeah. And and, and do you use one of those? Uh, somebody said that they do. I'm not even sure if it was yourself. Yeah, it was me. Um, I haven't actually built it yet. It's uh, the capacitive sensor arrived yesterday. So hopefully oh, cool. I'm going to do it today. Um, but yeah, That's, it's... Yeah. I've been waiting for it because it's just going to make a big difference to all the automations. And then it hooks in with things like the heating as well. So, you know, if we're both in bed, there's zero point having the heating running in, in anywhere in the house apart from the bedroom. Yeah. And, and, and again, there's other, there's other pieces as well, right? So you can look at like this, uh, the sleep IQ integrations in there. Um, mm. I thought I saw a couple others. Yeah. The smart um, mattresses and things like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, hmm. um, which is which is actually pretty cool, right? Again, that's that's one more, that's kind of getting away. As I was saying earlier, it's kind of getting away from having to use the UI, exactly. um, right? Not that there's anything wrong with the UI, but it's 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 a matter of usability, right? Yeah, at the moment so, we have to use an input select to say, "Hey, we're in bed," which you know you forget to do <laughs> most of the time. Sure, sure. Yeah, the right? other. Um, part of pressure as well is floor occupancy i guess that you can get pressure sensors that go on the floor joists so it can detect people walking around um they're mostly meant for you know security purposes but you can use them for other reasons other purposes as well yeah and 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 there, there's also occupancy sensors that look like motion sensors as well um so so uh in in my uh in my office at at work um one of the things they did uh, so when we moved to a new building uh, they actually embedded uh, occupancy sensors into the lights as well so motion as well as occupancy so motion kind of says hey there is motion so turn on the lights whereas occupancy is hey this person is in the room for a set amount of time and that's typically more in the office space rather than the kind of open spaces yeah um and hey you know what Bob is working in the in the office for for a little bit, so leave the light on, kind of deal, right? Um, except it doesn't necessarily identify the person. It's more around presence in the room. Is there or is there not a body in the room? So yeah, yeah. Um, the other one I've got here is um, ALPR, which is automatic license plate recognition. So that kind of ties into the cars thing. So um, I've got a camera on the way that I'm going to point at my driveway so that the camera will be able to go oh Dan's car is at home so he's probably at home or at least someone's home yeah well exactly right and and that's just it's just again more more fidelity to add to hmm. exactly yeah the the more data you can give home assistant especially with this new Bayesian sensor um the the better it'll be and I have to give a plug to John um, at my smart home blog again for his infrared occupancy detection that we keep mentioning, um, his yeah. RS four eight five network. He hasn't actually posted in a number of years, but I do have his contact details. Um, someone passed along his phone number to me, so I'm, when at some point I will actually get in touch with him and say, "Hey, do you want to come and talk to us about you know what you're up to now?" Yeah, Last time he posted. Cool to his blog was 20 uh, april 2012 so hopefully he's still doing it yeah that'd be neat yeah so yeah i had have to get a plug in for him because yeah, he was you know one of the original people and one of the people that actually did the some of the coolest stuff way back when mm-hmm. all right I think that's probably all on presence. I hope that's, you know, given people some inspiration. Um, someone in the chat said that there needed to be a disclaimer um, about how addictive automation is and how you may be inspired by this podcast and may end up spending lots of money 
Yeah, Hold we're on. we're sorry for all the time you're not getting back uh, <laughs> on on the account of Dan and myself, yeah. <laughs> and Phil as well. Um, yeah. No, but again, it, it's one of those things where, for me, I, I truly believe that technology is help helps our lives, right? So, I mean, this is this is a perfect application of that. So, um, but um, I mean, to everybody listening out there, keep the ideas coming. I mean, we're, I know I am, and Dan, you're on there as well as we're both on the uh, Discord channel. Uh, we've got our own podcast uh, channel in there. So, please uh, keep the ideas coming. Yeah, swing by, tell us what you like, what you don't like, what you want us to talk about, or, you know, volunteer to be on the show if you want, yeah. People are more than welcome to come and, you know, tell us what you're up to with Home Assistant or, you know, a cool thing you've implemented or anything, really. Yeah, that'd be, I would love to have you on. All right, I think that's us. Perfect. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll be back in two weeks. Hopefully, I'll actually release around the 1st of October this time around. <laughs> yeah, a couple of days That's it. today. That's okay. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks. Nice. I'm going to try and not edit this too much and just get it up. Just, I think there's just a a cough of mine to edit out and that's probably